Callicles. Callicles is the most important opponent in this dialogue. And uh, so we'll see Socrates tested more than anybody else does. The other ones seem kind of like maybe easy pickings for Socrates, but Callicles, as I've said before, he has his own philosophy. He knows what he thinks, and he's been critical of the other guys for not standing up for what they think. So he, he would uh, be somebody who, who will try to stand firm, okay, and will not say, or will try not to say uh, what he doesn't believe, okay, or to be ashamed, because remember he said, you know, the problem with Polus and Gorgias was they were shamed by Socrates into saying things that they didn't really believe. Okay, so Callicles doesn't have that problem in his view, and indeed, I have to say, if you if you have read through this argument, I challenge you to find a case where Callicles actually exhibits shame or you know acts like maybe he's embarrassed. Now he does trip up in his arguments. There are times when Socrates still gets him with his logic. Okay, but as far as indications that he might be embarrassed by what he thinks, not so much. Okay. So he really is much more consistent. Um, so I'm going to take you through a couple of arguments that Socrates uses to get out of him what he thinks and to maybe call into question what Callicles thinks. We sort of covered a little bit of this last time. We talked about this, but I want to reiterate it because it's really important that we understand this, this, this argument in particular. Socrates gets Callicles to initially say that those who he calls better and the stronger are the same, that the better and the stronger are the same people, okay? And then Socrates calls that into question by saying, but wait a minute, that, you know, we live in a democracy, and in a democracy, the people are the stronger because they're so numerous, and because of their numbers, they've taken over, um, and they rule, basically, or, you know? I mean, we could, as we've talked about before, we could argue that whether they really rule, Rhetoricians would say no, but nevertheless, you know, they had the power to change the form of government, okay? Well, um, you know, Callicles agrees to this because at the moment he can't, he can't figure out how to not agree with it, okay? That's probably what's going on here. At that moment, given that question, he can't figure it out, but later on he does uh, revise his statements, so to speak. So, he, you know, Socrates right away gets him in one of these contradictions like he's done with Polis to say that, well, then the many are the better, right? Because they're the stronger. It's a basic maneuver, you know, of reasoning. And so he's gotten uh, Callicles to agree to something that he doesn't really believe right away. It's not because he's ashamed, it's because as Callicles has pointed out before, he doesn't play these games, right? He said to Socrates, I don't live in your world, I don't play your games, and so, you know, it, unfortunately, I'm not as good as these, at these things as you are. But I don't get the feeling that Callicles is ashamed. He also gets him to sort of agree to these statements that the many have beautiful laws, you know, and that's based upon the definition earlier of what's beautiful. Remember, Socrates has established that for him anyway, something that is beautiful is good for us or pleasant or whole. Okay? And really the emphasis on what's good for us. All right, so um, he, he kind of agrees to that. Well, that's totally, as you know already, the opposite of what Callicles thinks. He doesn't think that the many make beautiful laws. He thinks those laws are perverse, that they need to be overturned. And then he gets him to also agree, so their opinions on equality and justice are correct, right? Well, at this point, Callicles comes right out and says, you're just quibbling and playing with words, and you know this is ridiculous. So he resists, and he refuses the conclusion, OK? Um, this should remind you of, of George Klosko's argument in the journal article I asked you to read because he makes quite a big deal out of this. But, you know, the, the Gorgias dialogue shows us the weakness of reason. That when you're confronted by a person like Callicles who really thinks he knows what's going on and is pretty firm in his convictions, 
it's not easy to use reason. Here we have somebody who's agreed every step of the way because he can't figure out how to not agree to these statements, but it doesn't matter at the end because he just simply refuses to accept the conclusion. Well, if somebody refuses to accept your conclusion, it, none of it matters. Okay? So it, it shows that there's more going on in the political world, as some people don't know, than just pure reason. Okay? And Costco thinks that this is really, you know, this shows Plato in transition from this pure belief in reason that if people understand my arguments, they will change and they'll be good and just and so forth, to the need for political <coughs> power to make things change and happen. Okay? So that's his theory. But at the very least, we can see there's a weakness in reason here, you know, and, and Socrates is confronted by a very stubborn fellow who likes things the way they are in his mind, and he's not, he's not you know, impressed by reason, okay? And if you really think about it, it doesn't take much thought to realize that in politics, reason doesn't always rule, okay? If you study the Enlightenment, you'll find a bunch of philosophers in France thought that reason could rule. And that you know the problem was education, and we just need to make people think harder and follow reason, and we'll all arrive at the utopian conclusion and run our lives accordingly. But actually, in the real world, people do like Calicles, and actually during the French Revolution, that's exactly what a lot of people did too, and took advantage of the situation and did what they wanted to do and didn't uh, you know conform to this reason. Same thing happened in the you know, the, re the communist revolutions later on. Sounds good on paper, not so good in practice, okay? So this is a deep truth, really, about politics that's being displayed here when Callicles get, gets angry. And no matter how, you know, how many arguments Socrates uses or how long they go on or how logical they are, Callicles can still refuse, you know? He's also said, you know, somebody like you, uh, ought to be slapped, you know, because you haven't woken up and, and, you know, realized how the world works. And while that's funny, it is a reminder of the way politics often works. It's, it's oftentimes a lot about coercion and force and aggression and um, willpower, frankly, to be able to push other people to do what you want them to do. All right, so that's the first attempt to uh, get Callicles to agree. The second one, uh, he tries to tease out more, okay, Callicles, if you really don't agree with me, then we got to go back and we've got to find out what you really meant by these terms. Obviously, you didn't mean that the better and the stronger are just the same thing. So what did you mean? Well, Callicles says, well, by the stronger, I meant the better sort. But they're not the same by the stronger I meant the better and the better are people who are intelligent and who have the will and desire that are superior to the masses okay so for instance on page 58 Callicles says do you really think I meant anything by by the stronger except the better didn't I inform you long ago that to me the better and the stronger are the same or do you seriously believe that if a pack of slaves and ne'er-do-wells, who have nothing strong about them except perhaps their bodies, get together and make pronouncements, I mean that these are ordinances? Okay. So a little bit hard to figure out exactly. He's not being terribly consistent here. But I mean, the, the point is made that he doesn't think that these slaves and ne'er-do-wells, in other words, the common people of Athens, have the qualifications to rule. Okay? So even if they get together in a pack and manage to do something, it doesn't make what they do valid in his view, okay? So that really is a revision of, of what he agreed to earlier. And he says that these, these better sorts, okay, should rule the cruder and more vulgar sorts of men. Um, so, for instance, he says, this I conceive to be justice according to nature. He who is better and more intelligent should rule and have the advantage over baser men. Okay. And Socrates says, 
trying to get him to trip up again. He says, okay, so should these better men have everything they want? He says um, on the bottom of 59, then should he, because he's better, receive more of the provisions than the rest of us, more things, okay? Or, or ought he, in virtue of his authority, to have over, control over everything? yet in the consumption of food and its use for his own person, should he refrain from taking advantage of us on pain of punishment? Should there be any sort of restrictions on this better sort? You know, or, or can he just, should he be able to do whatever he wants, even if it hurts the community? It's something very fundamental, okay? Should he merely have more than some, but less than others? And if Callicles, he happens to be the weakest of all, should he the best of all, physically weaker but intelligent and ambitious ha should he have the least is that the way of it my friend so he's trying to get him to see he still hasn't really defined his terms all that well do you really know who the better is have you really thought it through I mean if, a, if this so-called better man is very physically weak does that you know does he qualify in any case you know, what should he really be able to do? Um, and instead of addressing these questions directly, Callicles gets frustrated again and he says, you keep talking about food and drink and doctors and all such nonsense, but that's not what I mean at all, okay? So does he voice maybe a feeling that you've had from time to time? Why, are, why do you keep talking about these ordinary things, you know? Now, Callicles, Yes, he's very irritated at this point, but by saying that, he's also revealed a little bit more about what he values, and it's not these things like food and drink and you know whether you live in a nicer house. That's not what he's after. And I think that's important for us to understand because for a lot of us coming from a society that is fairly materialistic and where people think of profit in a lot of cases first, it's kind of hard for us to imagine somebody being so motivated by power and glory, but that's really what Callicles wants. I mean, he, he's disdainful of this other stuff. You know, who wants to waste their time thinking about, you know, if I've got better food or, you know, better wine or whether I've got a nicer home? I mean, all those things come with power anyway, but that's not why you do it in his view. You do it because the feeling of power itself is the best feeling of all. And that's why Callicles says it's the, it's the getting that feels good and that you want, not the having. It's the process of getting, because in the process of getting, you feel that power. Okay? That's what he thinks is so great and what, what he thinks that the better sort should be engaged in. They should be allowed to have that experience, which they are worthy of the getting of power and control over people, the getting of the things that they want, okay? Um, so <clears throat> Callicles agrees but doesn't agree because he thinks that Socrates is off the mark about what it is these people want. And, you know, he's, uh, there's quite a contrast here between the two of them. On page 60, under number 491, Callicles says, I've been telling you for ages in the first place, the stronger men that I'm talking about are not shoemakers or cooks, but those who use their brain for directing politics in the way it should go. They are, in fact, not merely intelligent, but also courageous and capable of converting their ideas and designs into fact. They are not the sort to shrink back through any feebleness of spirit. So it's their spiritedness. Okay. Um, which translates into their desire, the strength of their desire for power, for control, okay? Um, and yes, they have to be intelligent. The two have to go hand in hand, but it's not enough to just be intelligent, okay? Can you see why? A person could be really, really smart. You know, they could, be, you know, they could do math all day long, for instance. You find people who are so excellent at math, it's like, you know, speaking, their native tongue, okay. but they wouldn't know what to do with power if you put them into, you know, if you drop them into the mayor's seat or, um, you know, the governor's position. They'd be the weakest person possible in that position, 
Okay. So just intelligence, even if it's just broader than just something like that, intelligence isn't enough. And in fact, many intelligent people are quite, they, they quite don't care about power even. You know, that's not even on their radar screen. They're so interested in what it is that they are interested in that they, they don't think about politics. Um, which reminds me, some of my professors at NIU, where I got my PhD in political, political science, um, they were, you know, the political philosophy people. So they tended to think about, you know, philosophy more than about the nuts and bolts of, of politics. And there were one or two of them that shockingly would not, didn't even vote, okay? Um, if you asked them about current events, they were like, yeah, whatever, you know, I'm, I'm reading Plato right now. <laughs> so uh, they, they saw things in such eternal terms, you know, eternal problems and so forth. They weren't interested in the daily uh, life, the political life of their, of their society which was a little bit much for me, because I think you'd have a responsibility to, to do that. Um, and I think it's interesting, and the, the, the two definitely apply to each other, um, which I hope you'll see throughout the course. But, but they were that type. I mean, these two were brilliant guys, okay? and really very helpful and nice, and, and, uh, and uh, I'm not speaking ill of them. Please don't, don't you know. <laughs> Don't strike me dead here, but uh, but I, I when I first heard um, one of them say that I thought, oh my God, what? But you know he was just too busy thinking about what really fascinated him to spend any time reading the newspaper. So there's a lot of smart people like that, and Callicles would say even Socrates is airs too much. I mean he was interested in current events. But he didn't make any effort to actually get involved for the most part. He did that one time when he spoke for the generals and tried to, to save them. But he never tried to run for office. He never made a big deal over trying to get people to think about changing policies and so forth, speaking in the assembly, that kind of thing. And so he didn't he, he wasn't actively engaged in politics. All right. So Callicles thinks it takes somebody like that, okay. You have to be intelligent, but you have to know what the intelligence is supposed to be for. Socrates is intelligent, but he doesn't know what to do with it. He doesn't have the ambition and the, the drive okay, that he should have, and that's why they get into, you know, what does it take to be a man later on? Well, it's not, it's not enough just to be smart. You've got to know what to do with that intelligence. So <clears throat> at this point, we have Socrates saying, one thing, of course, and Callicles saying another. Socrates says, the best type of human being has self-control, okay? So he says <clears throat> at the top of page 61, uh, every man is his own ruler. Do you think it unimportant for a man to rule not himself but only others? Okay, let me read that again. Every man is his own ruler. Do you think it is unimportant for a man to rule not himself, but only others? That's what he says to Callicles. Callicles, in response, says, how can a man be happy if he's a slave to anything? Okay. So in this case, he's a, a, a person with self-control is a slave to himself. Okay. How can a man be happy if he's a slave to anything? No, my friend, what is beautiful and just by nature, as opposed to convention, which he thinks is what Socrates is talking about. What is beautiful by nature, I shall now explain to you without reserve. A man who is going to live a full life must allow his desires to become as mighty as may be and never repress them. When his passions have come to full maturity, he must be able to serve them through his courage and intelligence and gratify every fleeting desire as it comes into his heart. This, I fancy, is impossible for the mob because they don't have those great desires. Okay. So for Callicles, the happy man, the happy person, is somebody who has big desires and pursues them and pursues them endlessly, and it's the pursuit okay, that makes a person happy. For Socrates, a person like that is a slave, he says. You know, he's enslaved to his desires. He's out of control. You can only be happy if you have self-control. 
first you've got to control yourself and then you might be able to be qualified to have rule over others, okay? So you can't get any more different than that. So we have Socrates as a champion of temperance or moderation on the one hand, and then we have Callicles saying that the moderate type is dead. It's like being dead, you know. Life is having that feeling, okay? of chasing after and obtaining what you want. And a moderate person is always saying, nope, can't do that, can't do that. Okay. Where have we heard the word temperance before? Yeah. In Prohibition, right? Yeah, right. During Prohibition, the whole temperance movement supported Prohibition, and it was kind of a misuse of the word. That's why I wanted to bring it up, because you know, the temperance movement advocated no drinking whatsoever, okay, a total abstinence, <coughs> abstinence from drinking. Whereas temperance actually means being able to have enough self-control to do something but not overdo it, okay. So temperance is, is like moderation. And you're not moderate. Some people can't have a drink, and I understand that. But it's not a, a display of moderation to say, I can't have a drink, okay. Um, that because if I do, I will continue and I'll get drunk. Okay. So temperance, <laughs> rightly understood, or moderation is, I can have a beer or two, and then I can stop, okay? And, I, and I'll still be in self-control, and I can do it again the next weekend, and still be alive and have a good time, right? But, but not be out, of, not lose control, okay? And the idea behind that seems to be, you know, when you lose control, you do things that you later on regret, right? So by staying in control, you do what you really want to do. Now, you know, that's how we normally encounter the term temperance or even moderation when we think about it, is in the use of alcohol or, you know, something like that. But here we're talking about the power and the use of it in anything else that you desire, but mainly we're talking about power. And Socrates is, is basically making the same sort of point. If you get power, okay, or have a little taste of power, and you just got to have more and more and more and more, you're out of control, and pretty soon you're going to make a decision that's going to end up hurting you. Okay? So only if you're able to control yourself will, be, will you be able to use the power over yourself and maybe over other people to do things that will benefit you, let alone other people, okay? But, you know, you can't even benefit yourself if you don't have that control. So, very different perspectives on life with Callicles saying, you know, somebody like you just doesn't know how to live. You have, you have given up on life, you know. And you say that you are self-controlled, but really maybe you're afraid, you know? You're afraid to live. You're afraid of what might happen. Now, <clears throat> Socrates tries to get Callicles to see his point of view about moderation with a couple of different stories, you might say, or examples to help him to think about what he's trying to say. One of them is the leaky jar, and the other has to do with a little beach bird. Um, the beach bird is, if you've ever been to the beach, which I'm sure most of you have, sometimes see these little birds running around, constantly you know, pecking in the sand to get little bugs and mussels and things like that. And you know, their whole day seems to be nothing but eating. And Socrates says, that's kind of like the life that you are promoting here is this, you know, do you really think that's the best life, you know, to constantly have your head in the sand trying to eat something, so to speak, okay? Yeah, the bird feels good when he's swallowing it, but what else is he doing with his life, okay? Is he making any choices? Or is his fate kind of mapped out for him? So that's one, and this leaky jar is the other. Uh, Socrates says, you know, your life is like a man who goes to the well to get water, and he fills up his jug, but as he's walking back, 
the jug's got a crack or a hole in it, and it all leaks out. By the time he gets home, it's gone. He has to go back. It's sort of like a, oh, God, what's that story? The, the God who had to roll the rock back up the hill all the time, right? Um, for Socrates, the better life is the, the, the life of the well-ordered soul. And what that means, let's see if I have a pen. I've got a yellow pen. Let's see if that works. Okay. What that means is, for Socrates, reason needs to rule in the soul over your spiritedness. And it's spiritedness that, that Callicles thinks should rule. Okay, And then appetites or physical desires come third. So the order needs to be like this. Socrates came up with this idea of the three-part soul. Okay? That the soul has these three parts, reason, spiritedness, and appetites or desires. Okay? And I like that, especially in this case, because Callicles isn't. He said, I'm not talking about food and drink and things like that. Okay? I'm talking about courage and ambition. Okay? And that's spiritedness. Okay? So, so uh, Callicles would say the soul should look like this spiritedness on top okay. over reason and then maybe appetites if he even agreed that there's three parts to the soul but definitely he would see it this way your spiritedness should rule and your reason should be used to obtain what it is that you want okay and Socrates says no your reason needs to be in charge and then it will control and moderate your spiritedness and your appetites so that you obtain what is good for you. Okay. It's not that it's going to eliminate those things, and those things aren't necessarily bad. You know, some people have uh, posited that, that uh, Plato and Socrates were anti-physical or anti-body or anti-whatever um, in the physical world, but it's not anti, but it's the relationship that's important. Okay, it's not that uh, Socrates looked down upon people who like to have a drink, or had sex, or any number of things, or had political power. But it was what decisions they made about those things that he concerned himself with. So he was concerned with the physical world. He did not dismiss it, but in order to negotiate well in it, your reason has to be in charge. And here we have Callicles saying, no, you know, a real man, a real man is somebody whose spiritedness is at the forefront. Because without it, he's dead, you know. Callicles says this is somebody who's totally controlling the best part of himself and denying himself those feelings and experiences. Okay? All right, so do we have that? two of them and there are different opinions down okay well Socrates keeps trying and you have to think this is more for the benefit of others than of Callicles at this point but he makes some pretty good arguments he finally kind of gets past the talking about food and drink and doctors and so forth and gets down to what he's really trying to say with this argument he says look uh, what is pleasant or pleasurable and what is good are not the same thing and what is painful and what is evil are not the same thing and he thinks that Callicles equates the two which he does okay so Callicles says whatever gives me pleasure is good remember and whatever I don't like that is, uh, that is painful to me is bad Socrates says nope they're not the same thing okay now when you think about it, this what Socrates is saying is a part of most people's um, existence, most of your experience, um, if you just think about it a little bit. Um, before we get to this argument, just think about the last time you went and got dental help, okay? Like got a tooth pulled or you know, a cavity filled or something like that. Was that a fun? Uh, no. 
Um, none of that stuff is, but you go because you know that in the long run you will be healthy and you won't experience more pain, right? So you do it because it's good for you. But at the time, it doesn't feel good, you know. I hate getting my teeth cleaned. They use this uh, sonic thing. This totally drives me crazy. I hate the sound of it, you know. So I'm sitting there for half an hour while this lady's going on my teeth with this. It's just terrible, you know. I have to try to think about something else. I got a TV up there and I'm watching the TV, you know, trying not to think about the sound. Um, but, you know, I go every six months because I know that actually it, it not only you could end up having a toothache and, and be in worse situation if you didn't catch your dental problem, but it actually affects your overall health. You can get heart problems and stuff from having bad teeth. So, you do it because it's good for you. Same thing with any sort of procedure, really, right? And actually, same thing sometimes with education. I mean, some education is fun, but some is not, but you still have to do it, right? Like, you do have to get through subject matters that you don't like. Some people really dislike mathematics, but you do have to know a certain amount to be able to operate in the world effectively and, and to get your degree. I mean, you have to at least have college algebra, right? Um, and or to graduate from high school, you had to get a certain amount of math. You might not have liked it, and the reverse is true. Some people hate, the, you know, anything having to do with uh, literature or the arts. Right? It just isn't their cup of tea. But the degree makes you do it, and you're better off as a result because you don't want to go out in the world not knowing anything about the stuff. That's the definition of an un uneducated person. Right? So you do it because you know in the long run it will benefit you and make you better. So this is the kind of point that Socrates is making here. He's saying, look, you know, what is good for you and what feels good are two very different things. With Audrey Hepburn, I think that was the starlet's name. Um, is that right? Yes. yes. She's so pretty. Um, she thought, well, money is fun, you know? I mean, I can just have fun all the time. But it wasn't good for her to pursue it endlessly like that because she's about ready to sell herself to the highest bidder, basically, is what it is, to be blunt. You know, is that the best thing for a human being or is it treating yourself like your property? That's what she was doing or contemplating doing, actually. So Socrates tries to get at this distinction between pleasure and good and pain and evil by making this kind of observation. He says... You can feel the two of these simultaneously because they're feelings, okay? So, for instance, when you drink because you're really thirsty, for a while you feel the thirst and it also feels really good to drink, so you feel them at the same time. However, to drink that, whatever it is, is either good for you or bad for you. You know, if you're out in the ocean and the only thing you've got to drink is the, the seawater, is it a good idea to do that? No, you'll, it'll actually make you die faster, It'll feel really good if you're really thirsty, but you'll end up dehydrating. So, you know, hopefully you'll never be in this situation, but if you are, wait for some rain um, or do something um, to condense some water. So, they're really two different things. And uh, he says pleasure and pain like that tend to cease at the same time. Once you've drank enough, if you keep drinking water... You can actually get water poisoning. Did you know that? Yeah. You can actually kill yourself by drinking too much water. Okay? And long before that, it becomes very unpleasant. Okay? You don't want to continue to drink or eat way past when you know, you're full. Okay? It, begin, it, it, it feels uncomfortable. And you know you've got to stop. You start getting a stomach ache, whatever. Okay? So they stop around the same time, actually. But he says, and I know this is somewhat arguable, but this is his point of view, okay? He says, good and evil can't exist in the same way, at the same time for the same purpose, okay? It's something is either good for you or it's bad for you, okay? It can't be both. Now, you might be thinking, well, a person can be both good and bad for me, right? Like, for instance, you know somebody 
He turns out to be a pretty bad friend that you can't trust. However, on the other hand, he works at this great company and he actually gets you a job. Those are two different purposes. Okay? But he's either good for you as a friend or he's not. He's either good for getting a job or he's not. Okay? That's the kind of point that, that Socrates is making there. Okay? So he's basically saying they're just two different things. You know, good and evil are about what is truly good for us or bad for us, what benefits us and what doesn't. Okay? Truly, not in our opinion at the moment. And see, that's, what, that's what's controversial about Socrates' perspective and Plato's perspective, is that they really thought that there were things that were truly good for you, whether you thought so or not, okay? naturally. So there's the, the kernel of what becomes the natural law tradition in the Western uh, world right here. Okay? When, uh, when they argue, you know, whether you think so or not, there are certain behaviors and certain positions and so forth that will benefit you and others that won't. That in the long run, the consequences will not benefit you, either by making you unhappy or by physically hurting you or something like that. Okay? And of course, others will argue there is no ultimate truth. Okay? There's no natural law, and it's just a matter of opinion. And that's Callicles' perspective. That's, you know, well, maybe even more so Gorgias's perspective. Okay? So this is Socrates' perspective. All right? So this is what he concludes, that good differs from pleasure and evil from pain. And, of course, he would say that it's much more important to think about good and evil than pleasure and pain. If you understand the difference between good and evil, you will know how to conduct your life to avoid pain and get the pleasure that does not hurt you. All right? um, he uses another argument here that's designed to sort of emotionally jerk a little bit at Callicles because it's very difficult for any guy like Callicles to disagree with, it, with these statements. He says, so, Callicles, would you call fools and cowards bad? Well, who wouldn't, you know? I mean, are you going to say, no, they're good. Cowards, no problem, I love them. No, of course not. This was a very military-oriented society. You know, a real man was somebody who did military service, or if he hadn't had a chance to yet, would, and would, would comport himself well, and would not act cowardly, right? So, of course, he says yes. And he says, would you call those who are wise and courageous good? Yes. Okay, who wouldn't? But he says, he points out, both of them receive pleasure and pain. And a lot of things are out of their control, especially on the battlefield, which is where he points this out. Um, you know, when the enemy is advancing and, and people are under attack, everybody's afraid. Everybody's bracing. Okay? And there's fear. And then when the enemy retreats, when it looks like uh, you're going to be safe, there's a certain type of pleasure there. There's, you know, relief, satisfaction, okay? And actually, he says, the coward, if anything, feels more of that pleasure because they're, they're more afraid and they feel better when the enemy retreats, okay? So here we have life, don't we, right? That's life in a nutshell, right? You know, the person who has a character defect oftentimes gets more of something good than the person who doesn't, right? But that doesn't mean that good is not something to consider or is not something worthy of pursuit. And so he's saying, look, you know, there's no necessary correlation, okay? Goodness is a character trait in this case, as well as bad or evil is a character trait in this case. And they don't go along with pleasure or pain here at all. Okay? Um, so, I don't know, he does get Callicles to go along with all these arguments, but again you get the feeling that Callicles is just kind of going along for the ride. Um, Socrates says on the bottom of page 73, kind of concluding, do you see surely that our conversation is on a subject which should engage the most serious attention of anyone who has a particle of intelligence? 
So there he's saying, you know, you're talking about the intelligent people, but so am I, okay? The truly intelligent person should think about, he says, in what way should one live one's life? Should it be the, the one to which you urge me as being the activity which best befits a man, speaking in public, practicing rhetoric, engaging in politics in the current fashion, or should it be this present life of mine immersed in philosophy, and what is the difference between the two of them? Okay. So that's nice because he brings it back to the central argument, the central issue of this dialogue, rhetoric, the use of rhetoric. Okay. And he's saying, should I follow your advice, and Gorgias, is a, Gorgias gave him the advice directly, you know, stop philosophizing, and learn rhetoric and use the mind that you obviously really have a really good mind to do something with your life that's of value. You know, have some political influence, make some money. So he says this really is the question. You know, should an intelligent person practice rhetoric and do what it takes to gain pr predominance in society, as Gorgias has promoted, or do you withdraw from that and, you know, being a philosopher means basically, you know, thinking about right and wrong in this case, thinking about uh, good and evil and conducting your life accordingly, okay? Um, because philosophy wasn't institutionalized in the way it is now, okay? So what he's saying is, you know, do you, do you, do you want to live life Gorgias's way or my way? You know, my way is not going to get me political power, and I'm probably not going to be rich. But he thinks that he's more in control of his destiny, and he's doing what he wants to do. So he poses this, uh, the question, which we already know really is at the heart of this dialogue. Okay. And then next, Socrates discusses this role that can combine the two can combine the role of the rhetorician with the philosopher, so to speak, okay? There's this third way, at least potentially, if, if we interpret it in a certain way. Socrates poses this figure of the true orator, okay? And it's an important part of the dialogue, so I really want to highlight this. You've got to understand what he says. Um, in this edition, it's at the top of page 79. It's maybe two or three inches above number 505. Socrates has been talking about justice and self-control. And then he says, It is these qualities which the moral artist, the true orator, which is the true public speaker, okay, will have in view in applying to men's souls whatever speech he may use. To these he will apply absolutely every one of his actions. Whether he bestows a benefit or takes one away, he will always fix his mind upon this aim. The engendering of justice in the souls of his fellow citizens and the eradication of injustice, the planting of self-control and the uprooting of uncontrol, the entrance of virtue, and the exit of vice. And I'll just put this up here for a second because this is, this is the one spot in this dialogue where philosophy and political power come together. Okay? Now, there's another interpretation of this, which is that Socrates is really talking about somebody like himself and not a political leader. So we've got at least two options here. Socrates could be talking about a rhetorician who is first a philosopher, somebody who understands justice, good and evil, right and wrong, and then has the power of oratory, the ability to communicate, which he and Gorgias both agreed you have to have in a democracy. In order to do these things, okay, to plant justice in the souls of his fellow citizens and to get rid of injustice, self-control planted in the uprooting of uncontrol. Okay. So the true orator is somebody who uses his speech to make people better, okay? who would use his speech to propose legislation that would form people's habits in the right direction. And you know that's the way idealists think, right? I know that we're not all comfortable with that, I that idea or the government should do that, but that's the way an idealist thinks. Okay? 
So he's either talking about a, a true politician, a true statesman, okay, who is able to communicate to people with rhetoric, or he's speaking about somebody like himself, a philosopher who works behind the scenes to try to persuade intellectual leaders in his society who then go about making the change. Okay? Or maybe he's talking about both. Okay? But I think it's neat that he may be entertaining the possibility that there is a good use for rhetoric. You know, previously he had said, a good use for rhetoric is to use it to turn yourself in or other people in if they've done wrong. Okay? which sounded extreme, and it certainly sounded extreme to the people listening to him. Okay. But here we have something that sounds a little bit better and not as questionable. You know, a, a good politician. Okay. Is there such a thing as a good politician, somebody who cares about the common good? No. <laughs> people are like, no. <laughs> so, well, I'm somewhat of an optimist and I think that it might be possible that not every politician is out for, whoops, didn't need to do that. Not every politician is out, out for just gain, that you might be able to find a leader or two um, who has the right intentions. And if so, wouldn't you want that leader to be really effective, to have the rhetorical skills to be able to lead? Socrates does tend to think, as an idealist, to be a leader means to persuade people to your point of view, not just to put out a poll like so many of the rhetoricians of the day did. They didn't have stati statisticians, but they did feel out the views and the sentiments of the population and then kind of give them back what they wanted to hear. Socrates does not think that's leadership. Okay? Leadership is first knowing what is good for people and then bringing them along to your point of view. Okay, so this true orator, whoever he is, does that. And this is probably a good time to bring in part of the parallels reading. Um, if you've read it, and if you haven't, you should have by now, um, there's a part of it that deals with George Will's ideas. George Will is a, is a commentator, a political commentator. And the reason I chose George Will to highlight is because, first of all, he wrote a book a while back called Statecraft is Soulcraft, and the very title is platonic. And George Will's educational background is in political philosophy, and he is an admirer of ancient political thought. And I know that he had in mind this point of view when writing the book. There he is, if you, well, he's a little younger back then. But he still kind of looks the same. He looks kind of dorky, but that's part of his style. So here's some of the quotes from the book, okay? And these give you an idea of the influence, that he thinks the same way that Plato thinks here, about what good leadership is and what a leader ought to do. Okay? For instance, he says, a government obsessed with responsiveness is incapable of leadership. What he meant by that was that the politicians and the leaders who just try to figure out what people want and give it back to them is not leading. Okay? So much of politics, and you do have to do some of this, is finding out what, what resonates with people. We go through all sorts of lengths to find out what words and what ideas and proposals resonate with people so that during campaigns we can win. Okay? And you do have to do that, right? To a certain, if you ignore it, you'll lose. On the other hand, um, if once in office you continue to do that, thinking to run for the next time, you never do lead, is what Will is saying. You do have to get to the point where you think about the common good. He says rhetoric must foster public spiritedness. He thinks that most political rhetoric is very divisive, that it's usually, um, you know, the Republicans versus the Democrats, or more and more it's factions within the Republicans and Democrats fighting with each other. And, you know, that ultimately doesn't help. You do have to do some of it, again, you know, it's a democracy. but. 
if you can't get beyond that, then all you're doing is dividing and you're not encouraging people to think about the, the common good again. Okay? Um, he actually comes out and says government should foster virtue. And in the parallels readings, there's an example of this from a column that he wrote about state-sponsored gambling. You know, Will says, well, I know this is not popular to say because people tend to think that their moral choices is none of anybody's business and the government's not involved at all. But he says, but government's always in our lives all the time encouraging certain behavior and discouraging others. And one of the things that he gets on is the lottery. You know, he says, I'm not against private gambling, but when the state makes money off of gambling, it sort of puts uh, the moral stamp of approval on gambling. And there are people, he says, who are greatly hurt by gambling, who don't know how to handle gambling, who can't stop. You know? and, and oftentimes it's the people who have the least amount of money who lose what little they have gambling. Uh, not just with the lottery, but maybe through the lottery, through getting used to doing that and thinking that's okay to moving on to much more expensive gambling. So he says, really, should the state be involved in that, encouraging a behavior that does hurt some people? Should we make our money off of that? Um, he, he doesn't think so. So he knows that he's saying something controversial, and it's something like what Plato is saying, that government, through its leadership, through its laws, encourages certain behavior and discourages others. And he says, it's impossible to get away from the moral impact. You know, we have a tax code that's, that encourages people to get married and have children. Okay? Um, it encourages behavior, right? Well, with the Affordable Care Act, now it will encourage you to get health care and at a young age so that you can sort of support your your entire society. Okay? That is a a moral position. There's no getting around it in his view. Okay. And if we don't recognize that every every decision of government has a moral impact, the leaders aren't able to make truly responsible choices. Okay. So uh, he condemns the intellectual class in this book saying that they have become sort of hired hands for political causes rather than um, sort of fulfilling their role of trying to get people at all levels to think about the common good. They tend to become politicized and work for the left or the right, you know, uh, or to, to advocate a particular political cause. So interestingly, he's a conservative pundit, but, um, but in this book he says, Intellectuals need to be able to step back and sort of be objective, okay? And the more objectivity, the better, because they fulfill that role of making their society think. And if they're too uh, tied to a particular partisan position, they can't do that. They just become a part of the yelling back and forth and the, the argument, okay? All right, so... Ultimately, this is his point, and this is, this is the platonic perspective right there. Okay? Government is always about soul craft. Its actions always help shape society's character, so it cannot be value neutral as we would like it to be. And therefore, leaders have a real responsibility to think about what values they will transmit, how will the decisions and the laws they make shape people's behavior, and as a result, they conclude their character. Okay. First your behavior and then your character. It's interesting. That's the Aristotelian perspective. <coughs> All right, so uh, that's about as far as I want to get, but we have a few minutes, so are there any questions? 